Hispanic Business Association, Shoes and Clothes for Kids, the Greater Cleveland Partnership, and University Hospitals. Joe has also served as the regional representative for the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and has received local and national recognition for his entrepreneurial accomplishments. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, quite the august panel that can cover any number of topics tonight. However, the topic at hand, of course, is uh, dealing with issues uh, germane to the African American and uh, Hispanic Latino communities. So let's begin our dialogue. And the first question um, actually was kind of brought up by the panelists as we prepared for this uh, discussion. It wasn't originally on my list of questions, but we added it because I thought it was compelling uh, once it was shared, and that was simply, is there a divide in the African American and Latino communities? And if so, why is there a divide? I mean, didn't Rodney King say, can't we all just get along? I mean. <laughs> Is, is it true that there is an actual divide? Have you seen that in your travels? <laughs> this is going to be a long evening. <laughs> so much I, I figured Pastor Max. I, I was not on the conference call, and I was not the one that brought up that question. <laughs> but everybody's playing safe, so I just. Uh, uh, I read a book uh, a few years ago called Presumed Alliance. And the book, the book is written by Nicolás Vaca. And basically, he talks about the fact that, um, you know, this whole sense of unity between African Americans and Latinos is really something that is really being challenged right now. And there are some great examples of that. For example, in Miami, Florida, there had been some serious tension between Cuban Americans and African Americans. Uh, there are some who feel that Latinos have been really uh, not very hospitable and, and friendly to African Americans in, in, in the southern part of uh, Florida. On the other hand, if you go to Southern California, when uh, Mayor Villarraigosa ran for the first time, uh, African Americans voted with the, with, the, with the Republican, the very conservative folks, just to make sure that this Latino would not get elected. And you could go on and on and go from city to city and state to state and recognize that, that there is some tension and that uh, for us not to talk about that is really foolish. And it, uh, it, contrary to, to that notion that what we need to do is really get in front of it and begin to have a conversation, have a dialogue. And actually, part of the, the motivation for having this, this black and brown dialogues is to be able to have those candid conversations about how we can, how we can share the, the urban landscape. One of the big issues that is really has created some serious tension is the issue of, of the undocumented uh, uh, populations. Uh, I was born in Guatemala, so obviously that's a social proximity issue for me. So, uh, you know, there's some myths about what undocumented Latinos are doing here. There's some fear that has kind of uh, over, uh, has gone into even the African American community. So uh, it is with that intention that I think that there's, there's some divisive issues. There's the fact that now Latinos, you know, we can say that we're the largest minority population. And sometimes, if you say that with arrogance, that can be threatening. Uh, if, if you say that in, in terms of, uh, let's bring solidarity, that could be a real thing. So I could go on and on this, but I, I think that there's some divisive issues. I would, I would narrow it to the issue of immigration. Immigration is an issue that we all need to address. I believe um, <coughs> that there is a divide here in Cleveland, and my um, Judgment is about the number of Latinos who are in my inner circle of acquaintances, and the number is very small. So I was thinking about this as we had an earlier conversation, and it occurred to me, I am an old school Clevelander, so that means that I grew up in southeast oh, uh, Cleveland and, you know, had to dust off my passport to go to the west side. So, you know, clearly grew up east side. Uh, thought about elementary, middle, and high school, and do not believe that there were any Latinos in any of my classes. Um, even think about going to college, uh, first jobs. Cannot remember Latinos being part of either my professional or social network. And I'm really embarrassed to even say this at this juncture, but it was not until very recently when I put together a group of 18 women of great diversity that I expanded my network of Latino women. 
So for me, it is very evident that there is a divide, and I don't believe it is divisiveness as much as there is just we don't know each other. Um, I have stayed where I have grown up, essentially, and I have not crossed bridges to be intentional about building a Latino um, circle of acquaintances. Shame on me. Joe? Randy, I think there is a decisiveness, and uh, it's really not in the younger ages, because African American and Hispanics, they play and they enjoy, they go to school, and there's a camaraderie. I think when you get into the business environment and everyone is fending for their own peace, that it's like, I'll take care of me first and mine before I'm willing to share. And it's pretty evident and those that can acknowledge that, understand that, because it's always a networking. I'm gonna work with those I went to college with, either African American or Hispanic, or helping each other. And especially when it comes into the business environment where in Cleveland and the surrounding communities, if there is a minority business component, it's traditionally African American because of the population, which you, you said earlier, then there is a, a second thought of maybe we should get the Hispanics involved after we have our fill at the table. And that's in the business community, that's the way it's evident. It's pretty popular. Sometimes people don't want to admit it, but it's there. I think in the younger ages, it's not there because everyone's learning how to get along, but when it comes into eat or don't eat for yourself, I think it's really more competitive. There is a decisiveness there. Okay, Diana was trying to say? I think it also uh, transfers to programs and services and even within education. We tend to see that there are programs that are created even by the federal government that are specific for African American populations. And the symptoms are issues that we have uh, within the Latino community sometimes are addressed by another program and it's almost a separate type of approach rather than looking at the socioeconomic issues that many times impact both communities. So it's, it's even beyond our you know, local and uh, national issues, even the government delineates sometimes how they fund or how they structure programs, uh, creating some type of divide. Okay, very good. Well, seeing no one else uh, jumping in on that, <laughs> why don't we, um, we've talked a little bit about the divide. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about what the two communities have in common. Because obviously I, go right ahead. I think that uh, we know that the generation of uh, Hispanic and uh, African American that is the largest is the youth, is people under the age of 25. And I think that we know, you know, most of us here are probably not at that age. We know that that's the next, next generation coming and following us. And I think knowing the issues that uh, they face um, is really critical for us to try to develop cohesiveness and unity to help that gener gener generation in terms of educational services or educational support or mentoring, building leadership. Because uh, before we know it, they're gonna be the majority and it's already happening in the largest populated states, but it's gonna affect all of us here as well. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I, I always uh, come back from an economic development standpoint. That's my uh, uh, specialty. And, 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 and in terms of uh, it, the issue of uh, divide and where we have things together, a lot of it is uh, a, a function of place. Uh, and why we don't know each other is because we've developed our communities <coughs> uh, in a way that we're comfortable with each other. Uh, you know, there's Hispanic neighborhoods and, and, and African American neighborhoods. And sometimes, in the absence of forms like this, you know, the twain don't meet. Uh, one of the things that is going to be occurring in the uh, uh, near future, and it goes to the uh, youth and where we may be able to come together, uh, in the uh, advent of the foreclosure crisis, in the advent of uh, the uh, uh, movement back to our, our cities uh, as a result of the fuel crisis, you know, we own uh, some, uh, our, our community development uh, organizations and, and our neighborhoods, we own that. Uh, and there is a real opportunity uh, in this dialogue to talk about ways of reclaiming uh, our, our communities in a way uh, in the redevelopment effort uh, that can really step forward and, and place an African-American Hispanic uh, dialogue in a, in, 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 a, in a formidable way uh, to confront the crisis we have. There's money in our neighborhoods, in, in essence. <coughs> 